in kind of the distribution of causes of mastitis on a dairy farm. And this is the results from a couple studies, but generally it comes out to, um, you know, if I took 100 cows on 100 dairies and cultured all their clinical mastitis, I'd probably come up with a third no growth. And no growths are actually a good thing because that cow found that bacteria and got rid of it. Uh, another third will be the gram positives and another third will be the gram negatives. And so, you know, when we're talking about antibiotic reduction, we're really talking about, you know, um, targeting it just at those gram positives and looking at other management uh, avenues to control those gram negatives. Um, a lot of our producers now are starting to go to culture-based therapy so that before they treat that animal with, with an antibiotic, they do a culture, decide if it's a, you know, gram positive, probably will benefit from antibiotic therapy, gram negative, supportive therapy, no growths, kind of let her ride. And today we're going to focus just on those coliforms. So coliform mastitis um, is gram negatives. Probably E. coli is our number one cause of coliform mastitis. We also have Klebsiella um, at certain levels on certain dairies. And so there are certain risk factors for coliform mastitis. Um, one is high bacterial challenge. So, you know, what, what are three of the products that cows make? What do cows make? Milk? Beef and manure, right? Okay. And so we have a little trouble with, you know, depending on, on uh, farm management and things like that, you know, manure can be a significant challenge, and manure has a lot of coliform organisms in it. So, you know, one of the risk management factors we can use, I always tell producers, you know, my favorite mastitis prevention tool is a shovel. You know, um, you know so the risk factors, a lot of manure, a lot of challenge. Um, transition cows, so those are cows that have just gone through the calving process. And what we've actually, we're asking a lot of these cows. We're actually kind of superhuman athletes because we're actually, actually asking them to go from pregnancy, have a calf, and start milking at an incredibly high level shortly after calving. So these cows, you know, first day they may produce 30 or 40 pounds of milk. By the third day, they're probably up to 80 or 90 on some of our dairy farms. And so that is immunosuppressive on them. And when we suppress their immune system, when we add in a high bacterial challenge, we increase their risk for mastitis. Um, and then there can be environmental stresses. The southeast sees a lot of coliform mastitis because they have a lot more days like this outside um, than we do at the northeast. East. So, um, coliform mastitis can vary in clinical se severity. So we can have mild, where we just have some abnormal flakes in the milk, to having a, a very sick cow as a re result of endotoxic shock and even having um, death as a result. There's a lot of discussion in the industry about whether we need to use intramammary antibiotics versus systemic antibiotic treatment. A lot of debate. Um, a lot more of it is focusing on what can we do to prevent it. And that's where the vaccines will come in. So mild mastitis, some of our probably, I don't know, 30 to 40 percent of our coliforms are, are uh, mild. This is a strip cup, so you take the first milk before you milk that cow, you check it. Visually, you'll see some clots and things like that or in some mastitis cases. Next one is what we call moderate mastitis. And so we have a cow that has abnormal milk and an inflamed udder. And then our severe mastitis are those really sick cows. And so what we've actually done with these coliform mastitis vaccines that have come out is actually, when I graduated from vet school many, many years ago, we had strep ag, we had staph aureus, and we had E. coli. The strep ags responded to treatment really well. The staph aureus ones, we removed those cows from the farm, and E. coli is in early in my practice days all died because they were sick. Now we've had these vaccines, and what these vaccines have done is they've actually helped us kind of mitigate the response of those cows to that endotoxin. They still get infected, but many more of them are mild or moderate and can get over it themselves. So let's talk about this core antigen vaccines. So for, you know, most of you are probably have been vaccinated in your life. So a vaccine is simply a biological preparation designed to stimulate acquired immunity. Um, and they can come in a variety of different uh, presentations. The one are, depends on our targeted disease. So we're gonna look at, you know, a virus or a bacterial origin. We have uh, vaccines to protozoal organisms. Um, they can be a vaccine against toxins. 
um, or they can be vaccines against surface proteins. And then usually we talk about them as far as inactivated, killed vaccines. That means we have organisms in that vaccines, they've been killed, they cannot reproduce disease whatsoever. They can stimulate immunity because they attract the immune system, but they don't actually replicate or cause any disease. We have attenuated viruses. Those are what we call modified lives, typically. You'll hear that, that phrase out there. Those, have ta those are ones that we've actually weakened that virus or weakened that vaccine bacteria, maybe done something genetically to change them a little bit, or maybe selected a, a, uh, a strain of it that's maybe not as virulent as what we see in the field. And then we, we use micro doses of that to kind of mimic a real disease, and the body responds to it as they would a, uh, you know, a naturally occurring disease, but at a much safer level. Um, our mastitis vaccines that we have licensed in the United States are actually Staphylococcus aureus lysogen, which is a Behringer Ingelheim product. And then we have a number of coliform mastitis vaccines, uh, JVAC, which is a, now a Behringer Ingelheim product, and Viracor, which is a Zoetis uh, bovilis, which is Merck, and then Endovacteria, which is Imvac. So there are a number of them out there. Um, a lot of them are pretty much the same, and we'll, we'll talk about the similarities and differences. So I'm gonna kind of take you from the big picture down into the little picture, and this is where I actually had to remember all my biochemistry. So you chemists in the room, if I get a little wrong, well, just you know, chime in, all right? So gram-negative bacteria, you know, our ones, our gram-positives have a nice cell wall, our gram-negative bacteria have some interesting little characteristics on them. Um, they have, they're more modal, so they have flagellum, they have pili for adherence, we go down to the next layer. They have a cell wall. And inside that cell wall, and we'll talk deeply about the cell wall here, they have a cell membrane that kind of encapsulates the powerhouse of that bacteria, the nucleic proteins, cell sap enzymes. And so this is kind of a common structure for most of our gram-negative coliform bacteria. We'll spend more time today talking about the cell wall and endotoxins because those are really the, the components of these bacteria that elicit the real uh, clinical disease that we see in our dairy cows. So kind of digging down deeply, a little deeper, this is the cell wall structure. So if we're looking at this, we have a, a, a stylized coliform, missing the flagella and the pili. Um, take a cross section of that and then we can divide that cell wall down into a couple of structures. So we have um, the plasma membrane, which kind of encapsulates that nucleic acid in the powerhouse, the power tools of that. We have peptidoglycan, which kind of adds a little structure to that bacteria. And that's part of, with the outer membrane, is part of the cell wall. And then embedded in this cell wall is where we're gonna focus more today, is we're gonna focus on those lipopolysaccharides. And so a lipopolysaccharide will dissect against in kind of the next, the next few slides. So, but these LPSs are actually embedded within this cell wall. So we look at those lipopolysaccharides. We kind of commonly call them endotoxins. And so they have a certain uh, biochemical structure um, all of our coliform organisms have these, have these endotoxin structures, these lipopolysaccharides. Um, outermost, they have this O antigen, which is a kind of varying number of sugars that are kind of attached together. Inside, we have our outer core, or our, our core, which consists of an outer core and an inner core. Those are, again, uh, um, uh, saccharide structures. Um, interestingly enough, they have a fairly unique uh, uh, sugar there that's a keto, keto deoxyoctanoic acid. And we use this as a marker to uh, look for endotoxins in products. And then inside the innermost layer is lipid A. And so that, that uh, consists of a couple um, N-acetyl glucosamine dimers, and then they have a bunch of fat, saturated fatty acids attached to them. And so that's, you know, chemical structure. Basically, it breaks down into uh, this kind of schematic, which is mostly what we learn in vet school. So the oil side change outermost to the environment, the core polysaccharides, 
and the lipid A. And one of the things that we know and we've discovered probably since the 70s is the oocyte chains are very species specific um, and maybe even strain specific or serotype. So, you know, o all E. coli may have similar oocyte chains. If we look at the next part, the core, those are very similar against all uh, coliform bacteria. So Salmonella, Klebsiella, E. coli. This is fairly well conserved, the core polysaccharide and also the lipid A. Um, and so this becomes kind of integral in how we've discovered our vaccine. So species specific, genus specific, and then lipid A is kind of our toxic moiety and also very highly conserved. So lipid A, as I said, highly cons conserved. Most of our uh, coliform organisms all sh share the same structure of lipid A. Um, the core antigen, again, is short-chain sugars. Um, again, those are fairly highly conserved against those, uh, against the, uh, among the, the coliform organisms. And then the O poly polysaccharide is those, those repeating uh, three to five sugars. It's highly variable. And one of the things that we found as they started developing these coliform mastitis vaccines is if we lose this O an antigen, that bacteria is much less virulent than the wild type. So what do these endotoxins do in the cow? You know, they're usually released on cell death or disruption. Um, and you know, their function is a protective permeability barrier, um, helps to kind of uh, elude the uh, immune system and destruction by phagocytic cells may have some adhesive uh, components allow for some attachment. However, once they die or they're dissolved, you know, break apart, these endotoxins are released and they're a power, powerful stimulant of that immune system. And so they kind of initiate a complement cascade. We see severe symptoms with that based on um, you know, release of tumor necrosis factor, prostaglandins, um, we get a lot of vasodilation, swelling, heat, fever, collapse, systemic shock, or septic shock, and it can happen very rapidly. And so as I said, when I first graduated from veterinary school, um, a lot of our E. coli cows died, you know. But with the advent of these vaccines, we've actually helped to kind of reduce the effects of these endotoxins on these cows and give them the opportunity to actually be able to survive coliform mastitis. So the, the development of this vaccine happened, and maybe Bruce knows more. You're a UC Day guy.